And I'm going to start with this one of the bad news. Earlier today, the South Korean military staged a, fire, a live fire military exercise around a number of islands whose possession is the source of a major dispute between North and South Korea. Um, North Korean artillery, um, as you may remember, killed South Koreans in 2010. And North Korea has said that it's prepared for a total war and uh, warned that the drills would lead to a complete collapse of ties. Well, so far, North Korea hasn't actually done anything and um, not responded in any way despite these warnings. So that's the sort of bad news, but it's slightly modified by the fact that nothing has happened and probably nothing will happen. The better news is really much more interesting. The US and North Korea are now talking again. Uh, a G20 in uh, Mexico, Australia along with um, um, the host Mexico in the G20 meeting are trying to develop a new push whereby the US and China can be brought closer together than they are at the moment. And um, you'll remember, of course, that Kevin Rudd, our foreign minister, um, has made a couple of very interesting speeches, speeches lately, on the idea of Pax Pacifica. Uh, now, interestingly, these, these, these speeches, one made at um, the Asian Society in New York and the other at Chatham House in London, don't seem to have been reported in the Australian press, but they're very interesting speeches. And obviously, the, our newspapers and our ABC had more of other things on which their minds are focused on, as we know, which is a bit sad. So we're going to press on uh, with our insight into what's happening in North Korea. Uh, and in our discussions tonight, we have Dr. Leonid Petrov, a long-time Korean scholar who studied North Asia at the University of St. Petersburg in Russia, and now is the Korean specialist at Sydney University. And Matt Williams, who was our ambassador in Seoul at the time of the last transformation of leadership up in North Korea. And also, we have got a discussion that I had earlier today with um, a member of the Nautilus Institute, uh, who is um, Peter, Professor Peter Hayes, uh, and who has another interesting perspective on the future of North Korea. So before I introduce our two colleagues tonight, I'm just going to ask you to listen to this rather tinny recording that I made a couple of hours ago uh, with Professor Peter Hayes, who currently is in San Francisco. Professor Peter Hayes, welcome to the Australian Institute for International Affairs here in Sydney, and thanks for joining us. Yes, thanks, Carl. I'm sorry I can't be there, but I guess this is the next best thing we can do in the 21st century is be on Skype, so there you go. Peter, when Kim Jong-il died, there was concerns about instability in North Korea. In the two months or so since then, Kim Jong-un has now established the continuation of the dynasty. Are the concerns about stability now less, or are they still there? I think it's still there, but I think it cuts both ways. You know, to get rid of Kim Jong-il, who in many ways had some points to prove against the United States, uh, going all the way back to 1994, when his uh, father, Kim Il-sung, in semi-retirement, reached over his shoulder and redirected the chip of state that Kim Jong-il was ostensibly in charge of, uh, away from confrontation with the United States, did this uh, deal with Jimmy Carter and then dropped in. Well, at that point, you know, Kim Jong-il really took over after nearly 20 years of ostensibly being in charge. Kim Jong-un comes in, you know, when Kim Jong-il dropped in at short notice, but on the other hand, everyone knew that Kim Jong-il was in bad shape. Uh, and it's very clear from the staging of the funeral in the morning and then the transitional presentation, this was well rehearsed. This just didn't all happen without any thinking ahead of time not only in North Korea, but in China. And so what one has seen is a relatively stable uh, installation of a very young commander-in-chief. We've never had uh, a commander-in-chief uh, of 27 years old with a finger on the nuclear weapons button before, so this is new. On the other hand, there have been many very young kings in Korean history who've always, of course, had a retinue uh, behind them 
uh, of supporters, uh, usually senior supporters, who create a kind of cabal. And at this point, I don't think anyone sees a risk of a coup or things falling apart. Uh, and there is the, the flip side of this, that with the discontinuity of Kim Jong-il due to his death, that presents, of course, a moment of opportunity, depending on Kim Jong-il's own predilections, breaking out the old mold. Uh, you know, we have to remember here that Kim Jong-il had this rather negative image, but in reality, it was extremely well informed. For example, when he went traveling to Russia in the late 90s on his train, he had a full broadband internet connected by a satellite with him in his train compartment. Uh, Kim Jong-un was actually educated in Germany for a couple of years, speaks a couple of Western languages, and so he's been exposed to networked culture and to modernity in a way that Kim Jong-il never was, even though he was aware of it. And so I think the flip side of Kim Jong-un is that he could well make an audacious move, a constructive move, as much as a confrontational, destructive mood of an extortionate kind that we've come to expect from North Korea. We really don't know what will happen. And so it was not surprising to me to see the United States actually make the single most important move that they've made since 2000, and I think it's six, if I'm not mistaken, no, 2004, actually, which is to uh, complete the negotiations to send American troops back into North Korea in the joint recovery missing in action teams where they recover the remains of American soldiers killed, and in fact Allied soldiers, but primarily American soldiers killed in the Korean War. And what this gives the North Koreans is a high degree of assurance that they're not going to be a subject of surprise attack because they've obviously had hostages whilst those Americans had boots on the ground. Those teams were there from 1996 up until 2004. Don Rumsfeld pulled them out without negotiation or, or notice, and I, I think that probably sent a shiver up the spine of the North Koreans. So how do we go back in? Basically what that said uh, to the North Koreans, to Kim Jong-un, is the Americans are hitting the reset button. Ball is now in your court. What do you want to talk about? So that's where we stand at the moment. The talks about the regime, it seems. Peter, can we now turn to the nuclear issue? The Nautilus Institute has been running detailed academic papers on a nuclear weapons free zone in North Asia. It seems improbable, but is there some hope that this could eventuate? Why would North Korea give up its key nuclear card? Not in the short term, but uh, again, they consider the bottom of the hole of their own making, a large part of the economic hole on top of a small pile of nuclear weapons, but they can't eat them, and Kim Jong-un, I'm sure, is anxious to get out of that hole. The only way they're going to get out of that hole is negotiating with the United States, China, Russia, South Korea, and Japan, uh, the support that will enable them to reconstruct their economy. They can survive for a very long time just sitting there, but that's not going to be enough, I think, for Kim Jong-un. So the question is, what is the stabilizing framework over time whereby one can re-engage North Korea, persuade them that over time it's actually worth giving up this small rather uh, uh, incredible arsenal. This is not a very credible arsenal they have at the moment in a military sense. Stop venting this aggressive nuclear threat rhetoric uh, and start dealing. And uh, my own view is that that uh, remains possible. Uh, and it's a question of uh, whether the Obama administration is willing to do what needs to be done along particularly South Korea. And if South Korea uh, the election this year brings about a uh, shift from the current extremely conservative anti-North Korean uh, occupant of the president to a pro-engagement president. I think the United States will back that and will see very rapid progress in early 2013. I'm not saying that will happen, uh, but I'm saying that there's a good chance that, that will happen. It has not happened uh, overall at the moment. Meanwhile, the Obama administration unilaterally is further recessing or putting on the back shelf its own nuclear weapons forces. It has none in the region for deployed, and it actually doesn't have very many nuclear weapons that are really usable in a meaningful military sense against uh, North Korea. They would probably have to use bombers at this point, which would be 
supported by daisy chain refueling tankers out of Japan or out of Guam or Alaska. But it's not easy to actually get nuclear weapons uh, onto North Korean soil from the United States. If you use ICBMs from fire from the United States, you have to overfly them over Russia, and Russia is not going to take kindly to that. I probably would not agree to it, but certainly would respond uh, in a very nervous fashion. Same with China. Uh, and some relaunch missiles uh, would be a very bad idea because they could be viewed as a preemptive strike on China, the angle if they would be fired. So that really just leaves you with slow motion nuclear war and kind of shuttle service from the United States with these strategic bombers, either B-2s or B-52Hs. So if you're the North Koreans and you're looking at this realistically, you're noting that the United States is actually further sheathing its own nuclear sword and uh, that in fact the United States is devaluing in fact what the North Koreans have in a very small way. So you know, the bigger context I think is shifting towards a nuclear free Asia. Uh, it will take time, but there are some very important overlapping and convergent strategic interests between China, the United States, and Japan that make a nuclear free weapons, a uh, nuclear weapons free zone. I think a very good idea, and uh, a number of policy makers and policy scholars are taking quite serious cognizance of this idea of the moment, looking at it very carefully in terms of its military dimensions, its political asymmetries and symmetries, uh, and in particular how you deal with North Korea in a zone at the outset, and would Taiwan be part of it? Uh, they're, the, they're the really crucial issues. Um, so it, it may look unlikely, but things have happened very quickly before. It was very unlikely in 1989 that in 1991, President Bush Sr. would withdraw all tactical theater nuclear weapons from the Far East, as, as well as around the world. No one expected that. It happened in less than two years. So uh, it looks, looks unlikely, but I think that the structural trend is there and that we're going to end up with some form of zone in Northeast Asia, just as we had in the South Pacific and the Southeast Asia tailored to the local circumstances. It won't be the same, uh, but it, 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 it will have a similar basic structure as those other two zones. Look, um, Peter, thank you very much for that analysis. We do appreciate you joining us for this short time this evening. So, some interesting points there. And I'd like to introduce um, our two panelists tonight, Mary Petra, lecturer in Korean Studies at the University of Sydney, and, and a Korean scholar who trained, as I said before, at the Institute of Oriental Studies in St. Petersburg. Uh, Dr. Petra has also held the chair of Korean Studies at the Institute de Tout Politique in Paris. I'm sorry about my French, not too good. I wouldn't get too far in Europe these days. And then, of course, Mac Williams, uh, my predecessor here as president. He was Australian ambassador in Seoul at the time of the last North Korean handover. So Mr. Williams is a former president of the, uh, uh, sorry, Mr. Mr. Williams is a chairman of the board of the UTS Research Program. He also chairs the Korean Australasian Research Center at the University of New South Wales. So welcome to you both. I'll ask uh, Dr. Petrov to start the proceedings. Um, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for introducing me. Thank you, everyone, for finding time this the end of this busy day uh, to come here and to uh, participate in our discussion. I will be given just 20 minutes to present my thoughts about uh, the future of North Korea after Kim Jong-il uh, Kim Jong-un uh, is going to be a good leader, but the stability is going to be maintained or chaos is uh, going to follow this uh, events of uh, last December. Um, it has been just one year since I um, presented my views on the future uh, succession mechanism, um, which is here at the uh, New South Wales chapter of uh, AIAA, uh, talking about um, still the succession had to happen by that time, but I was already talking definitely that uh, Kim Jong Un is going to uh, succeed uh, the uh, incumbent leader Kim Jong Il. Now today I bought this uh, journal, uh, Time Magazine, and Kim Jong Il is on the cover page. Uh, 
amazing. I, I had a bit of uh, argument with the news, news agent uh, uh, shop assistant uh, who was really asking me questions of what is going on in North Korea? Why can't these powerful people just overthrow this little spoiled brat? <laughs> and my answer was, well, he is, uh, well, the, the bloodline makes him a uh, legitimate successor. And he pounded his uh, fist over the counter saying, oh, the idiots, they don't know what they're doing. So excuse me, who is the head of uh, state in Australia? And this was, uh, <laughs> this was the end of our conversation. <laughs> So the power uh, of the bloodline uh, continues. Um, whether it's uh, youngest son, middle son, or any other relatives, like the youngest sister, or definitely not the husband of the youngest sister. And the question was still uh, open until the, uh, December the 19th uh, last year, when my telephone busted with telephone calls and uh, SMS messages. Um, I just learned two minutes after the news uh, was uh, broken by Korean Central News Agency in Pyongyang, all uh, media outlets started calling me, um, well, maybe because I'm available on, or, or all this, my mobile phone is 24 7 switched on, so I, I'm ready to answer the questions. And then this, this was kind of this bacchanalia of um, expectations and uh, speculations was continuing uh, for, for the following two weeks until Kim Jong un, um, the funeral procession, um, was uh, all one. Uh, the first question was who was going to be uh, the successor, second question what will happen to uh, North Korea, whether it's going to be uh, big chaos, um, collapse, uh, just in revolution type of uh, disturbance, or is it going to be a peaceful transition uh, with um, uh, all mechanisms working perfectly and uh, succession continue according to the script prepared by Kim Jong-il himself um, just months uh, one year before uh, he died, more than one year, in, uh, in September 2010, um, Kim Jong-un uh, was introduced to the public. Before that, nobody really knew who Kim Jong-un was. Um, people did not know his name, people in North Korea didn't know how he looked. Um, it were some rumors that uh, Kim Jong-un was preparing one of his sons to be the success, successor, um, the young general. That this is how people in North Korea learned about the future success. They did not know how he looked until um, September, September um, 2nd or 4th uh, of um, 2010 when the party conference took place in Pyongyang. This was the first time when Kim Jong-un was presented to the people. And just one year later, he becomes the head of a uh, self-proclaimed nuclear nation. It's up to us whether to agree to accept it as a nuclear nation or not, but definitely the Korean issue is a very complicated one. North Korea, it's not just a North Korean problem or North Korean nuclear problem as it is usually presented. Uh, what is going on in Northeast Asia is a Korean problem. And Colin just uh, started our talk today with this pretty sad news that South Korea uh, again staged the uh, uh, joint military exercises uh, open live fire in the disputed waters, clearly provoking uh, the response from uh, Pyongyang, or at least sending a message. It was like that in 2009 and then, <coughs> excuse me, um, when uh, South Korea and the United States tried to send send the message to North Korea. And North Korea got the message and um, sank a boat and um, shelled the island. So maybe got the message and overreacted, but. Um, what can we do about this issue, Korean issue, continuing for already more than 60 years? The issue which was engineered exactly the same year when uh, Israeli-Palestine problem was uh, engineered, 1947-48. Still, both uh, uh, nations, uh, both countries uh, in the Middle East and uh, in the Far East still uh, experience the trouble of uh, division and open confrontation, which very easily can turn, uh, transgress into the Third World War. So let's focus on Pyongyang affairs. So what are scenarios are available? Uh, um, I have just 10 minutes to present um, three possible scenarios which I believe are most plausible. 
well, one, uh, which was immediately suggested by the media, that um, the Justin Revolution will follow, the, uh, Kim Jong-un is an inexperienced young man who can't control the army and the party, and the people, uh, oppressed people of North Korea will rise against the dictatorship and demonstrate to the world that the wave of uh, revolutions uh, which are uh, now crossing the world 20 years, just 20 years after the first wave of revolutions, um, Soviet Union collapse and East, East Europe uh, democratization will now show the world that um, uh, social sciences really work and um, we really can uh, predict the future. No, it didn't happen in uh, North Korea at all. Why did it not happen? Because revolutions uh, don't happen uh, without certain conditions. While well, a variety of uh, experts and thinkers uh, try to predict <coughs> revolutions and make uh, them possible, um, Lenin was the probably most uh, uh, ingenious and uh, most skilled uh, practitioner of revolution. Karl Marx in, uh, enabled him with, with the theory. But uh, North Koreans are good learners. They are the elite of North Korea, starting with Kim Il Sung, the head of the uh, King's Dynasty, realized that people, uh, weak people, un malnourished, uh, underfed, and uh, powerless people simply cannot rise up against their oppressors. People uh, who have some uh, modicum of freedom, people who have uh, freedoms of information, freedom of travel, uh, communication, they actually might ask questions. People who devote devoid of these uh, freedoms can't. And this is what we can see in North Korea. So there, it, apparently it's a classless society. Well, there are some groups, elite groups, and there are some interest groups, stakeholders groups, but generally it's classless. There are no class of uh, property owners or class of uh, laborers and workers and peasants. And generally, North Korean society is very homogenous. So simply there's no change, there's no reason for one class to rise against the other. That's one of the uh, main foundations for the revolutions, and it's not in North Korea. There are some three groups, like the core group of revolutionaries and their descendants who are loyal to the regime, the group of vacillating people who have some, um, who don't have impeccable um, backgrounds, those who have relatives uh, in South Korea or in Japan, or those who come from the families of uh, uh, peasants who are supposed to be small landholders. And the third group of people is um, the, uh, the hostile group, uh, those who are uh, already were being watched by uh, public security agencies and perish in the system of gulags. So simply there's no clear conflict in North Korea to, to follow. There's no uh, conflict in the elite groups as well, because the elites are all uh, members of a very narrow circle, the circle of um, former anti-Japanese uh, revolutionaries and military guerrillas. This circle was narrowed down by Kim Il-sung back in 1950s, after the Korean War, and he eliminated any groups of potential rivals, potential hostile groups like Chinese uh, Koreans or Russian Soviet Koreans, so it's a very homogeneous group of elites. So their children and grandchildren, they occupy the positions of power. And they're very happy with their um, privileged position. They don't um, expect any improvement because they live comfortable life. They don't want any change. And of course, they would support anyone who pro will promise them the continuation and stability in North Korea. They don't care about uh, common people, about uh, difficult conditions. Um, of life in the rural provinces, they very self-serving and focused on their um, welfare. So, again, there's no split, uh, any kind of conflict among the elites. Uh, there's, uh, the, the state is very much per personalized uh, by, by the uh, king's family. Um, the whole Democratic People's Republic of Korea is treated as a hereditary estate of the king's family. Whatever is in North Korea, apparently it's a people's property, but uh, it's often managed, micromanaged by the state, sponsored by the king's family. All trade is being supervised by members of the, of the family. Even if you go, if you go to Pyongyang and go to some Taesong um, fast food restaurant, something a novelty in Pyongyang, kind of uh, um, hamburger place in, in Pyongyang, who does it belong to? Well, it's being managed by uh, the Ministry of Light uh, Industry headed by Kim Jong-hee, the younger sister of Kim, Kim Jong-il. So business in North Korea is also in very firmly in the hands of um, party bureaucrats and elite. 
some businesses belong to the Korean People's Army, some businesses belong to the Korean Workers' Party, and some are clearly managed by the King's family. Political culture of resistance does not exist in North Korea, as I just said, in the 1950s, Kim Il-sung eliminated any potential um, rivalry to his um, Seoul um, leadership. Kim Jong-il continued uh, what uh, his father started, and um, the very difficult years of 1990s, when Soviet Union collapsed, China um, improved its relations with South Korea and stopped um, providing condition, providing aid unconditionally was a very grim uh, period for North Koreans. North Koreans starved, different uh, sources give different uh, accounts, something between um, 300,000 and 3 million people, don't know exactly, and probably those who died of uh, uh, starvation related diseases, definitely more. So people were weakened during those years of 1990s, then people were given some uh, hope uh, by Kim Jong-il, who assumed the um, leadership position in North Korea in 2002. North Korea realized that without market mechanisms, it simply could not restore uh, stability and feed its own people. So in 2002, in July, the so-called 1st of July measure, economic measures were introduced. And people believed that it was a major signal to reform um, the economy. North Korea started um, uh, producing more agricultural products, uh, international trade improved, the relations with South Korea was booming at that time because of the sun, 10 years of sunshine policy. So there were a a variety of factors which improved life in North Korea during the 10 years between 1998 and 2008, when Kim Jong-il happened in 2008, two major events happened. Kim Jong-il got sick in uh, August or September, he apparently had a stroke, major stroke, which incapacitated him for almost the whole year. Uh, the power was uh, taken over by his um, close associates, first of all, <coughs> members of family, Chang Song Pek, husband of his younger sister, Kim Kyung Hee. Um, so there was a major rollback in uh, those uh, market freedoms. Post 2008 was the year when uh, President Lee Myung Bak uh, came to power with his election promise to be. Um, be pragmatic in relations with uh, North Korea. Pragmatic, pragmatic uh, means being realistic. What um, South Korean president was doing was clearly disengagement and uh, um, kind of taking disengaging with, uh, from North Korea, uh, reneging on all agreements between North and South Korea, and simply putting on uh, shelving all, all, all agreements and relations, relations both uh, cultural and economic. So North Korea became isolated again. Um, domestically and internationally, the nuclear crisis persisted, six party talks uh, stalled, and just in the middle of, of um, some hopes of um, improvement in uh, relations between the United States and North Korea, uh, just uh, several weeks before the United States was just about to promise uh, to resume the um, food aid, uh, humanitarian aid to North Korea, Kim Jong Il dies. Will, uh, well, we saw that um, just the revolution is simply not in the cards, um, current uh, Korean, North Korean affairs. What uh, other scenario can be possible? The second scenario is uh, the possibility of um, uh, Kim Jong-un being supported, ostensibly supported by the, by the interest groups, but uh, behind, this, behind this screen, uh, smoke screen of um, um, stability, uh, a sort of uh, <coughs> hidden struggle might um, unfold in uh, Pyongyang. Chang Song Tech against uh, military officials, the Korean Workers' Party against the, against the family members. Is it possible that uh, the members of the elite um, try, try and uh, depose Kim Jong-un as uh, in, incompetent, as uh, legitimate, and say establish some new regime where um, say the Democratic People's Republic of Korea will probably continue in, in title, but uh, launch a sort of reform and um, try to progress along a different direction, which uh, was uh, prescribed by Kim Jong Il before he died. Well, it is unlikely uh, simply because the elite, um, elite groups in North Korea live a um, comfortable life. They know that they have many privileges, like traveling overseas. Most of the children engaged in international um, and international trade and uh, foreign affairs. Um, they occupy positions of power in the party and in the army. So they know that any change, any 
um, kind of attempt to improve uh, this system will very likely lead to its collapse. Something that happened in the Soviet Union was very educational. Was Gorbachev in 1980s, mid-80s, proclaimed the policy of perestroika. He tried to, he did not want to uh, change the regime, obviously. Um, I lived in the Soviet Union, I remember the 86th Congress of the Communist Party was uh, calling upon the building of communism just uh, back in the 1980s. This was uh, uh, rather ridiculous, people would not support it. And Gorbachev tried to fix the um, system simply to avoid the collapse, but it was not possible. Very soon, Gorbachev himself realized that um, the game was up and he had to, well, Soviet Union disintegrated and the power was transferred to the republics. North Korea is in a very different state. North and South Korea still at, technically uh, at war with each other. They can't pursue the policy of openness or perestroika, or even the Chinese type of reform is unimaginable for North Korea. This Chinese type of reform, uh, if you remember, started with, by Deng Xiaoping when? In 1979. Exactly the same year, uh, the United States diplomatically recognized People's Republic of China. The United States are not going to recognize, recognize uh, the DPRK. It was very close to that uh, point uh, when uh, President Clinton was sending um, Madeleine Albright to Pyongyang, and there was a talk about uh, diplomatic recognition, no more. So um, for North Korea, without uh, diplomatic recognition of the United States, without uh, developmental aid, not just humanitarian aid, but <coughs> developmental aid from South Korea and other um, allies of the US, Japan, South Korea uh, group, it's impossible to uh, feel secure. Um, so North Korea is not going to open up. North Korea is not going to uh, allow its citizens, citizens to travel and do normal things like trade, cultural exchanges without uh, clear uh, diplomatic uh, recognition and security assurance. Um, trade uh, sanctions are still in place, so we, sh we can't expect from North Korea to change or improve its economy while the uh, sanctions uh, remain um, continue this um, attitude to North Korea where you can't, if you're a business person in Australia, you can't really do business with North Korea without, the, without jeopardizing your business. Um, so you wouldn't, wouldn't be allowed to transfer money or repatriate your uh, certain uh, income. So, elites are not very interested in any change. What's the third scenario, and the last one, and probably the most likely one? But not that nothing is going to change in North Korea. Kim Jong-un is going to learn uh, with his hands on the job and learn from his patrons and uh, mentors, uh, those who are much uh, older and more experienced than him. It's not a problem that he is only 28 this year, 29, but in the Korean um, counting system, he's 30. Well, um, he's, and this year was particularly, is, is particularly important for North Korea because Kim Jong Il's um, anniversary, 70th anniversary, was just celebrated by North Koreans. The, in April, April the 15th, North Korea is going to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Kim Il-sung. Um, so this year was supposed to be the crucial year when North Korea promised to announce um, the stage when it reached, had reached the stage of um, uh, being a uh, consumptive, uh, rich and prosperous state. But when Kim Jong-il died just weeks before the end of the year, I thought it was a very convenient um, occasion. <coughs> now, North Korea does not need to proclaim itself strong and powerful. So how come they strong and powerful without the GA leader? They don't need to keep up this promise. They don't need to uh, really celebrate. This all celebrations can be toned down. And they can save a lot of money um, on uh, all the celebrations which are not going to be as pompous, uh, bombastic as they're supposed to be. The Arirang Festival is going to take place in April, as it was just announced a couple of days ago, but we know that um, tourists uh, can't book their trip trips anymore. Many, some of uh, in the audience have already booked um, trips to North Korea in April, but recently North Koreans don't accept any bookings. Uh, North Korea had a very modest uh, celebration of Kim Jong-un's uh, 29th birthday, which was only marked by the documentary about his achievements. It was, um, it was something which um, dwarfed the cult personality of even his father. 
So Kim Jong-il is now eulogized as the greatest of, of great leaders, as a, as a jack of all trades, as, as a genius of all geniuses. He knows absolutely everything, particularly in uh, military affairs, and he's supported and uh, respected by the party, the army, and the people, and the army and the people of Korea's side. How much time do you have? No, Right, and so basically there's, I can't see any, any challenge to Kim Jong-un's um, single-handed rule with, by, by being supported by the army, the party, and the family members is very secure. People, common people in North Korea will remain silent for a while, we don't know how long, but um, the process of opening North Korea is very much hindered by the con continuing Korean War. It's basically a civil war where North Korea can't afford to open up because people will learn what has been happening to them for those 60 years. They know that, uh, North Koreans know that they live a difficult life, that South Koreans live better, but they don't know how, how much better. And the information is simply not uh, circulating. There's no postal exchange, there's no radio or TV transmission. It has been done, it's a legacy of the Cold War. And South Koreans uh, use uh, NTSC TV system, while North Koreans use the Chinese and Soviet type PAL uh, system. The listening to the radio is also illegal in North Korea, something which is not uh, tuned to the government sponsored, uh, government endorsed station can be a um, act of uh, crime. Uh, trips overseas are simply not possible in North Korea. Uh, only those who engage in international affairs um, travel, but they, um, the, the members of their family very closely looked after while they're overseas, so they can't do any movement. Any kind of any uh, act of defection also causes a major um, purges back at home. So n nothing is going to change in North Korea until two things: until the, mem the mem members of the league, Kim Jong Un himself or some of his close associates decide voluntarily, decide to mendle with, um, with, with the system, try to improve it, or try to change it, like open up, or, or something like that. So any, any drastic change in North Korea can be initiated from, from the top only. People simply at the moment don't have any power to, to ask questions or demand anything. They're too weak, there's no communications. Mobile phones are, but say they, can, they can't really uh, talk, uh, say from Pyongyang you can call, to the province, but from the province you can't reach uh, mobile phone in, in Pyongyang. Forget about IDD calls. The international calls are also prohibited and monitored. So uh, that's one possibility. Another possibility is, um, mm, well, the major change in uh, international regional policies, first of all. Unless we dismantle the, the structures of a Cold War, which we inherited from the 1950s and 60s, and the Korean War was the um, hot Hot war of the Cold War in, in East Asia. Unless we start, unless we stop thinking from the, these dimensions of Cold War confrontation, say we are the allies of freedom-loving uh, South Korea, Japan, and the United States, and they, Russia, China, and North Korea, uh, against us. So this, this is how China, this is how Beijing and, and Moscow um, structure their uh, attitude and international policies and relations, look at Syria, look at uh, Iran affairs, so Russia is very much antagonistic. So Beijing is uh, very very paranoid about what is happening in its eastern borders. So any live fire exercises, particularly if it joins South Korean, American, Japanese exercises, um, hurts and paranoids China very much. So China has no other way but to support North Korea. China does not want to wake up one morning and see that American troops advance from the from Faso, from uh, Panmunjom, closer to, to the Chinese Sino Korean border. It's not uh, it, it's, it's not, not not going to be supported by China. So they will do uh, Beijing will do everything to buttress uh, the regime, both economically and politically. And um, in South Korea, the current uh, conservative government of Lee Myung Bak, uh, well, the election year. The, might or might not bring um, the opposition to power. We will see what happens. Obama administration will also might um, actually inherit some uh, positive, constructive approach to uh, North Korean issue, or something similar to what during the Obama uh, during the Clinton administration. In that case, some change in inter inter-Korean relations might be possible. 
So first, inter-Korean relations. Second, the Cold War structures in the region. And um, well, general attitude uh, to North Korea also has to change. And we, sitting in Australia, we think that North Korea, um, we don't know much about North Korea. That's what we're doing at the University of Sydney, teaching uh, Korean studies from the perspective of uh, Korea as a uh, divided state. Um, uh, this semester is going to start in 10 days' time. Um, the uh, lectures on contemporary Korean society and culture will be equally um, divided between North and South Korea. We want Australians to know what is going on, what, what led to this conflict, how this conflict is continuing, how can it can be stopped. We do it at the graduate, uh, undergraduate level. Postgraduate students learn how to um, overcome this division and um, reach uh, and help Koreans to reconcile. Thank you very much. Good evening, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen. We've had two very comprehensive presentations and I don't want to spend a lot of time because I think we have a lot more value out of questions and answers and discussions. A lot of territory has been covered. I think the, the critical factor is to realize that it is one of the most complex situations anywhere in the world. It involves all the major powers. No other place in the world involves directly all the major powers like the Korean Peninsula. So there's a whole level, series of levels of how this has to be looked at. And we've gone through those with Peter and with uh, Leonid. But just to recap, the critical thing is that what happens inside Korea, inside the two Koreas, is very important, critical. But even more important is the international environment in which this all takes place. And particularly, I think, in these days when we're spending a lot of uh, effort in Australia and elsewhere at trying to crystal ball where China and US relationships may go, Korea sits firmly in the middle of that environment, both as a possible cause of problems for China and the US, or indeed as a situation which China might want, for example, to um, excite a little in return for the pressure it sees from the United States, which they find unpleasant, e.g. Taiwan. And I think many in South Korea have lived for a long while just worried about that. that does Korea become the sideshow to a US-China long-term confrontation? That's one level of where I think we need to be watching things. But the cobweb of the six countries involved in the six party talks of their own bilateral relationships is very intense. And we've got time to go through it all today, but just to analyze where, for example, China relations with North Korea, China's relations with South Korea. Well, take China's relations with North Korea, and it's covered that pretty well. Um, I was reading something just before I came here by my American colleague uh, years back in Seoul, Stephen Bosworth, who's now, uh, or has been <coughs> a special US envoy into North Korea. And he summed it up, I think, pretty well by saying, China has more influence on North Korea than they let on, but not as much as the rest of the world assumes. <laughs> And I guess pretty well where we are. It's just how much there. So I'll leave, leave North Korea for the moment because although there have been interesting enough over historical times, differences between North Korea and China, not least of which in the Chinese language being banned in North Korea. But also, particularly more importantly, I think, very severe criticism of the Chinese reforms that we had mentioned back, what, 10, 15 years ago. North Korea really unloaded on China for bastardizing communism, etc. But leave that all aside. One of the other important things, though, is the China South Korea relationship. Now, well, it's hard to understand this, I guess, because China effectively forced the war to where it was by coming into the war. And one would have assumed that that might have left very lasting 
difficulties for South Korea and China. Far from it. Korea is now the third largest trading partner of China. South Korea, sorry, the third largest trading partner of China. And the third largest foreign investor in China. And for Korea, China is its major trading partner. Massive economic linkages have developed between those two countries, which will, over the years, continue to grow and strengthen that relationship and put it into another. We could then go through Japan, South Korea, Japan, North Korea, Japan, China, US, China, all of those have got very important imperatives. The biggest one clearly is US, China. So without spending too much time on that, I think what we talk about what's happening in North Korea, who's going to do who to what, always has to be seen against the backdrop of where does it fit in? And in the end, will Koreans either south or north dictate the way it's, it evolves? I think the answer is probably not, but the Koreans will see it differently, both sides. So that's one thing I think it's important to do. Um, people control is something that I've never seen anything like, except when I went into North Korea some years ago to the groundbreaking ceremony for the Kedo reactors, like water reactors. Just, a, just an anecdote there. Me is much more uh, aware of all of that, but just what do you mean by people control? We were in a, a large white marine research vessel from South Korea, spanking new, carry about 300 passengers, we were parked at a wharf on the east coast of North Korea. It was an old fishing village. There was a mother ship that was rusted and tilted in the water in front of us. There were a dozen rusted trawlers out there. But the most important part of that wharf was that we linked the two parts of the town. And there was a lot of people walking backwards and forwards, about 100 yards from the boat. One of my other diplomatic colleagues and myself, we sat on the deck and for one hour we counted how many people walked up that little length there. 250 people walked by the way. Only one looked at the ship 100 yards away because they'd been told not to look at the ship. I've never seen anything anywhere in the world like that. There weren't people with guns saying don't do it. It was just the, the control, the, the cellular control they've got. Uh, it was interesting talking to the 500 or some of the 500 workers on the site, South Korean workers on the site, stuck right in the middle of North Korea with a thousand North Korean workers. What were the relationships? What did they learn? Well, the first thing the North Korean workers said to them was, why did you take the trouble to paint Korean names on all the heavy equipment that just come in? Samsung, Daewoo, Hyundai. Because it's American equipment, isn't it? And no concept that in fact South Korea is a much better builder of trains and trucks and that sort of thing. Uh, so I think while some people know what's going on in the South, very few. Uh, so that's just another one. I think the other one is really when we're talking about uh, right now. If we just talk about the, the importance of the US North Korean Network. Two, two important considerations there. One is the Americans have never successfully been able to manage that. They've had three or four, not failures, well, one failure certainly, but certainly others where they've mishandled the, the tank. Not understanding the North Koreans, which is a huge uh, challenge. And the worst of those was the infamous ABC policy. Anything but Clinton. When George Bush was elected, in foreign policy terms, they put on the, on the shelf for at least six months any of the Clinton initiatives in foreign policy, the worst being the Korean one. And that was a chance where we might have actually got to the next stage in the Six Party talks, but it was lost. And this year, as Peter has pointed out, or Peter has too, we have both an American election and a South Korean election. So there are two big cards to play in this, how are they going to work out? Clearly, um, the Republican position on North Korea is as hard as you can get. Um, and that was not going to make things easy. 
uh, it won't make things easy for Obama being to be too flexible in this period. He would have to be watching over his shoulder all the time for the domestic side. In the South, uh, we've seen already that President Kim Jong Un has actually softened his tone in the last six months towards North Korea. Although the news that uh, Collins just uh, announced that uh, would seem to put a lie to that. But certainly in questions of discussions about um, food aid, which is still very much on the agenda, uh, the uh, South appears to have been moving to a position where they want to be more receptive to reducing some of the, the caveats. The good piece of news, which you didn't announce, is that uh, on the 23rd of February, the Americans and North Koreans are going to meet again. Having been delayed for so long, they're actually going to meet and discuss where things go. And that immediately leaves on just the last comment. The other very difficult relationship in all this is US-South Korea. And two, two big elements there to worry about. One is that as with the, uh, the Vietnamese talks, which I had myself much more involved in, the question of who sits at the table, who talks, becomes so important. If you're in South Korea, the population almost double that of North Korea now, and certainly much more powerful in, in all sorts of other ways. It's pretty galling to be sitting there hearing the Americans and North Koreans talking one on one, and you're not there. So the Americans have lots of difficulty, and the South Koreans have lots of difficulty presenting to their own public how this is going on. So that would be one, one key element. Uh, sadly for the South Koreans, or, and for the Americans, the opposition in South Korea has now come out with a very solid, solid attack against the FTA, which was signed last year between South Korea and the US. And, uh, this, this could cause enormous difficulties between both countries, particularly as protectionism is growing in the United States. And there's no way that Obama could get a repeat of that at this stage. So I, I've probably confused things, but I just wanted to put that in perspective that it's, it's fascinating to, to hear people like Leonard and that talk about the detail inside. That's very important because not many of us know very much about it. Indeed, I think most experts on North Korea from the outside would say, Anyone who claims to know what's going on in North Korea, you don't believe them, because so much is made up. And the media, of course, has a field day in the middle of all this. This whole uh, characterization of Kim Jong Il as some lunatic, which the media love to feed on, uh, and miss the whole point of what's going on. He was a bloody good poker player. He has, for his one little card, nuclear weapon, he's played that on leverage at least three times now and got major concessions. And they still got to play again. It's like the joker in the hand. So uh, I think that's that plus, uh, I, I also was contacted by the media at the time of Kim Jong-un's uh, death. And the point I made to them, the same as you did, mate, was that uh, don't panic. These things are, are being sorted through. And my confidence was that it would be sorted through. So please don't run the headline you ran this morning, which was, there's a frenzy in Korea about what's happened. There wasn't a frenzy in Korea about what's happened. Koreans understood. And those who understood Korea understood. But it, it was just such a good headline story that it had to run that way. OK, thanks. <laughs> Everyone should be aware of any headline which uses the word friends. <laughs> okay, um, just a short time left for people to ask questions or raise points with either of our two speakers. Um, answering your question about the nuclear capability of North Korea, well, North Korea is um, self-proclaimed nuclear State. The problem with uh, this North Korean nuclear issue is that the uh, um, United States, first of all, does not want to recognize the status. And North Korea finds this very offensive. It's kind of double standard. Although we have the nuclear bomb, we have the carriers. We don't, well, um, India and Pakistan have the same. They have developed it after the non proliferation treaty was signed. Um, why, why everyone accepts India and Pakistan 
as nuclear powers, but not us. Um, well, double standards. So that's why North Korea blew up. Uh, the first nuclear test was in 2006. Uh, and it was either a failed test or fake test, because it was too weak to really be um, recognized as a nuclear. But the United States immediately, even before any kind of uh, residual particles from uh, uranium were detected already, proclaimed that North Korea conducted a nuclear test, although it was very weak. Um, it, it also arose a lot of concern from China and Russia because they were not consulted with about this first failed or fake uh, test. And faking a nuclear test is very easy. You just put a lot of nuclear enriched uranium or processed plutonium rods into the sh mine shaft and blew up some TNT and <laughs> 500 um, kilotons of TNT is not a problem for North Korea, which is a mountainous country. They produce a lot of coal and they, they use it everywhere. So, um, second test was the real one in uh, 2009, and it uh, convinced the world, um, but not the United States, the United States, it took about two weeks to recognize it was a real test, because it just, I don't know, the reason that it was a real test, and China and Russia were very angry with uh, North Korea for not consulting again uh, with them, and because of the city of Vladivostok, and uh, just uh, 200 kilometers away from it. What happens if all these nuclear fumes come from the shaft and uh, go across the border to, to Russia or China uh, because of the testing side is very close to China. So I don't think North Korea is going to um, test the patience of Moscow and Beijing <coughs> very soon. There's no need for that. Moscow and uh, Beijing um, help continue to provide some sort of assistance to North Korea, moral assistance first of all, uh, and uh, financial assistance from China. Um, as for the carriers, well, you know, North Koreans don't have successful history of uh, ballistic missiles launched either. Um, those tests which uh, were conducted in 2006 and 2009 uh, show that uh, they can't really deliver the payload, nuclear payload. Units. And the bomb, uh, probably North Koreans have a handful of nuclear devices, nuclear bombs, a dirty bomb, the one which can explode in the air at the moment of launch, nobody really needs it. So I don't think North Koreans will try to, again, experiment with uh, uh, ballistic missiles too often because the ballistic missiles have to fly somewhere. Uh, definitely not to China or Russia. Uh, if they fly over Japan and land somewhere in Japan school you know, or shop, it's going to antagonize uh, necessarily uh, relations. So I don't expect any um, ballistic missile or nuclear tests in the future, they're simply not nuclear. Right, uh, some cynical people call it uh, the great North Korean weighing competition, <laughs> which is sad because people were traumatized, people uh, did not know what to expect next. I remember I was in the Soviet Union in 1981 when Leonid Brezhnev died. I was 11 years old, I think, and I was intimidated. I was really confused. I didn't know what to expect. And it was very grim and heavy atmosphere in the, in the streets of Soviet Union. Although everyone was laughing, had been laughing about, about uh, <clears throat> aged uh, Leonid Brezhnev and his uh, inability to properly react to uh, circumstances where he was put on. But um, it was a quite scary moment for North Koreans who don't know what's going on outside of the country. They know many of North Koreans who experienced the devastation of um, the Grand Famine in the 1990s when Kim Il-sung died. Kim Il-sung died in 1994, 1995 already was uh, three years of famine which cost up to three million people's lives. They don't want this to uh, happen again, but they understand that there is a possibility of this repeating, the drama uh, repeating. Still people were, when I was in North Korea, um, 2007, um, with uh, students at the postgraduate uh, North Korea study delegation. We were taken to a museum uh, by our um, host, the uh, Academy of Social Science people took us to the Revolutionary Museum. And when we entered the room uh, dedicated to the death of Kim Il-sung, the person who was conducting started crying. Well, initially we thought it was just for kind of, um, sort of sympathy or kind of sign of uh, loyalty to the regime. We didn't pay much attention, but he kept crying 
room after room after room. We couldn't stop him. He was crying, <laughs> genuinely. So I attributed to the trauma which people in North Korea experienced in 1994 in the consecutive years of like everyone in North Korean family lost their loved ones in, the, in this grand family. And this was attributed to the um, death of Kim Il Sung. So now, after Kim Jong Il was gone, so what will happen to us? Kim Jong Il was like father. And in Korean society, which is very Confucian society, very traditional one, death of a father has to be um, mourned um, and lamented. And public mm -hmm. lamentation, of course, the regime supported and approved this sign of grief. Um, these days, there's a big debate whether North Koreans who didn't cry, whether were they punished for that or were they not? Well, um, difficult to say, but uh, definitely it was a very traumatizing experience, particularly when winter was just getting really cold. North Korean, Korea now just experienced the um, coldest winter in the <coughs> five years. Um, so how many people froze to death? How many people um, lost their income and uh, the husband, the, you know, uh, animals, domestic animals, the crops are going to be reduced. So all that contributed and compounded the grief over Kim Jong-il's death.